Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, I want to greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus. You saints in West Coast are very precious to us. And we're sorry that our regular visits to you have had to be deferred this year because of the situation of COVID-19 that we all know too well. Uh, we also want you to know that Lorraine and I have been praying for you all, especially through these last weeks, as you have lost one of your beloved church members and elders, Mike. And we stand with the family and you all as you walk through this deep loss. Lorraine and I had a very, very dear friend of ours die of cancer earlier this year. Her husband was also one of my closest friends since college, university days. I said to him, as we were talking about death and eternal life and heaven and being in the presence of God, you know what, Keith? Eileen probably won't even take a look back. She's walked into the presence of Jesus. Why would she look back at this life? And I confess that I've grieved for my friend Keith, who's lost his soulmate of many years, but a bit less for Eileen, who's in the best place possible, the presence of the living Lord Jesus. That's what it's like to have hope in hard times, which is the theme of your current teaching series. And life is a strange business, isn't it? We have the hard times, like our current uncertainties uh, in the present situation that we're in, and many national leaders not knowing what to do in our current situation, mixed in with good times. Here in the UK, we're locked down again for the month of November. And yet, just a few days ago, our youngest daughter, Esther, gave birth to a beautiful little girl, Cariad Alison Joy, a 10th grandchild for Lorraine and me. We're delighted in the midst of pressure. Um, for those who don't know the name Cariad, it's a Welsh name. My wife has Welsh heritage and it uh, keeps shining through. It has to be said, Cariad is a Welsh name that means darling. So we come this week to 1 Peter chapter 5, which Ron and I are sharing on together. And we've been given the title, Living Hope for the Church. And my assignment is to talk a bit about how elders can bring hope to the church. Now, let me be clear. Uh, our hope is in Christ. <laughs> and so what elders want to do more than anything else is to point you to him uh, above everything else. And they definitely don't want you to find hope in them, but in Christ. Actually, that's one of the great privileges of being a pastor to God's people. It is you're constantly pressing people into God and you're praying that they flourish in him uh, as they walk with him day by day. At the same time, sometimes people need God with skin on. It was a famous phrase I first heard Bob Mumford use. It's like, it's like you can lose God out there. Sometimes to have someone who is the embodiment of the Father's care, people who can touch you and hug you. Sometimes people need to touch flesh and blood. And leaders have the privilege of bringing hope and peace and security to God's people. I remember many years ago now, one of our precious young couples in the church in Oxford that I was leading at the time, uh, they were looking forward to the birth of their firstborn baby with great excitement. Sadly, at somewhere between five and six months, the baby died in the womb and obviously had still to be delivered. This all happened just as Lorraine and I were going on holiday with our two youngest children. This young couple, who we'd been very close to, said to me, we need a funeral service next week. Who will conduct it? I said to her, I, I said to them rather, I will come home for the funeral. I knew that Lorraine would have wanted me to. And when I interrupted our holiday to come home and conduct the funeral of this tiny little child, this young wife said to me, Thanks for coming home, Steve. It means so much 
we needed a father with us. Experiences like that burn something into the heart of a leader. They know that they don't in themselves deserve to be appreciated like that, but and that they have lots of failings and don't even merit the responsibility and the call to care for God's people. But what a privilege it is at the same time. Just before reading these few verses from 1 Peter chapter 5, which we're going to look at, let me refer you to some important verses in Acts chapter 14. Uh, so here we go. It says of Paul and Barnabas, uh, chap uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 23, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to their faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and, with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord in whom they put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia and so on. So Paul and Barnabas have been sent out by the church in Antioch to preach the gospel and establish these churches in different places. They then returned to the groups that they'd established to strengthen and encourage them. When you've invested in some people or seen some people, some Christ, your hearts are with them and you want to encourage them. One of the things that Paul and Barnabas realised uh, that was a challenge to these new believers was the difficulty and hardships they would face. And so it says, uh, so they appointed elders for them in every place. These elders were to be shepherds and overseers and guides for God's people. They set them in place knowing that they would watch over, help and encourage God's people. Do we see the connection? Trouble and hardship, so appoint elders. I still think that's one of the major roles for elders in the body of Christ. They protect God's people, watch over them to see that they're flourishing as they walk with the Lord, and love them with the love of God the Father and his Son Jesus. So these elders become pillars of hope for God's people. Which brings us uh, to 1 Peter chapter 5. As you well know, Peter's writing to a number of Christians and churches dispersed over uh, Asia Minor, uh, various places, uh, and he wants to encourage them too. So here we go. This is the passage that I'm speaking from and Ron speaking from the next few verses. So 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 to 4. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's sufferings, who will also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you're willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So... Let me just make a number of points that come out of these verses about how good elders and good leaders bring joy to God's heart and bring hope to God's people. They're ever so simple, but hopefully a good reminder. The first thing I want to say, which is again an obvious point, the Apostle Peter identifies himself with the elders in the church. At the beginning of his letter, as you know because you've read it, he calls himself an apostle. He's clear about his own calling. Now, in order to show that he understands the job of local leaders and elders, he calls himself a fellow elder. To the elders amongst you, I appeal 
as a fellow elder, I've done this caring role and encouraging role. Apostles are not super elders. Apostles have the same heart as local elders in caring for God's people. They're not uh, you know, just interested in some dazzling superstar ministry so somewhere else. And the church is not a pyramid. The Apostle Peter sees himself as right alongside uh, the elders in place. I hope that's how Ron and I can come alongside local elders too as we come and meet you at various times. And as an elder, Peter expects to keep on staying witness to the death of Christ and someone who hopes in future glory. If there's one thing that the death of Christ means and the resurrection of Christ means, it's, it's that the, the, the price has been paid for us to have a relationship with God and we've got a glorious future with him. That's where we're all rooted. That's where leaders need to be rooted. Now, <clears throat> there are lots of current trends that we can get involved with and interested in new theologies, new ideas. But actually, the thing that gives us solid hope is the death, the glorious death of Christ for our sins, which opens the door to us to have a relationship with the Father God as sons and daughters of him and the resurrection of Jesus as victor over uh, death once and for all. So the elders carry hope in their hearts because they're rooted in Christ. They're rooted in Christ, death, resurrection and future glory. Now that's our hope and it's the hope of the church. And so, so the Apostle Peter says, I'm right there with you elders. That's my hope in the death and resurrection and future glory that we will enjoy with Christ. Secondly, God loves leaders who love his people. God loves willing leaders, not reluctant leaders. And sometimes people also say, do I have time to fulfill this responsibility in the church? You know, I was raised in the city of Liverpool by a pastor who none of you would know, uh, but he was 40 years a pastor in the same place. He was at, he, it was a rough, tough area of Liverpool. He was actually just sort of amazed that he ever became a pastor. He was born again in a revival uh, under sort of Pentecostal ministries called the Jeffreys Brothers. Um, and he had a job to do all the, all the way along. He, he, he was, because the church wasn't sort of wealthy enough to support him. Uh, so he was an undertaker at the same time. But every time I would meet him or talk to him, he would sow into me the importance of serving Jesus. A hey, son, he would say. Uh, that's the way they talk in Northern England. A hey, son, there's nothing like serving Jesus. It's like, I can do the undertaker's job, but the thing that really matters is there's nothing like serving Jesus. And, and God wants leaders who've got their priorities right, who understand there's nothing like ser serving Jesus. This is the most important thing. Leadership is not a distraction from our other work or careers or leisure activities, but a high call to bless God's people and to care for them. What could be better than that? God loves leaders who serve likewise not those who are looking for their own position, honour, reputation, or here, maybe even money. But in our celebrity culture, where the, the world loves celebrities, and, and even the church can be tempted in this direction through all of our televised programmes and all the rest of it, God loves leaders who understand how to wield the bowl and the towel. Obviously, that's supposed to bring back to our minds the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. But until Jesus walked into that room, there were 12 proud hearts and 24 dirty feet. Jesus comes in the room, gets a bowl, gets a towel, washes their feet, humbles himself. God is looking for leaders who serve like that. God loves leaders who inspire others to 
imitate them by setting a great example. He's not looking for people to try and beat people around. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. But we inspire people by setting an example of love for Jesus, uh, devotion to his kingdom and his word. The, such leaders are a source of security and blessing to God's people. And thirdly, God, the great shepherd of the sheep, rewards leaders who lead like him. If we care for God's people, we do so on behalf of the great shepherd of the sheep. For that matter, we find our wisdom in him, our direction in him, because he cares for his people far more than we do. It doesn't all depend on leaders, but they can be channels for God's care to his people. There is a reward for faithful leadership. <laughs> Praise God. And I can't help but think of a father to many of us, Barney Coombs, who, who kept going right to the end in his care for other people. What wonderful examples people like that are uh, to those of us who have to live in the challenges and difficulties of this world. So here are my simple conclusions. First of all, if you're a leader, here's how to do it in these few verses. Selflessly, inspirationally, humbly, caring for God's people like we care for our own children. We can be a blessing to many, many people and strengthen them to walk God's way amidst adversity. There is no greater joy than to see God's people flourish as they walk with God and to be alongside them and help and encourage them. Just recently, I had the delight of conducting, this is just before this last lockdown, conducting the wedding of a young couple. Uh, the, the husband had lost his first wife a couple of years ago to cancer. He was left with two young children. And the wife had lost her husband to a very sudden heart attack 18 months or so ago. He was one of our pastors uh, in the region in which I live. And uh, after several months, these two found one another and fell in love. And what great redemption to, uh, to conduct their wedding and see <laughs> these two families, uh, one with two children, one with three children, come together with a great sense of delight, but they'd found God in the midst of pain. They found God in the midst of adversity. We'd walked with them through their circumstances. The husband's a worship leader. For several months after his wife's death, he didn't work, lead worship because he was broken inside, but he found God, he walked with God. I have to tell you that his worship leading is now more anointed than ever it was because the reality of God is something he's found and drawn down from heaven into his own life. Um, it's just a delight to walk with God's people in adversity and in joy. And leaders, if you're called to do that, it's in these verses how you do it. Selflessly, inspirationally, humbly, caring for God's people like we care for our own children. If you're not a leader yet, Paul says to Timothy that aspiring to lead is a good thing. Why wouldn't you want to care for others? Why wouldn't you want to encourage others who need strengthening and care? What a great opportunity to show God's love to others, to be like rocks in times of adversity. This leadership is not about you as a leader. It's about the people of God and being alongside them in their difficulty. And just like these elders were first appointed by the apostles Paul and Barnabas uh, to strengthen people in their adversity, we can also strengthen people. Uh, so I'm encouraging people who aren't yet leaders to think, I'd love to help other people. I'd love to encourage other people. I'd love to be alongside other people. And maybe to talk to your current leaders and say, do you know, I aspire to do that. Uh, is there any way that you can help me become the sort of leader who can really care for others? Well, this morning, God bless you as you find this living hope for the church. And some people who can express that living hope are elders 
who walk with Christ. God bless you. Good morning, West Coast. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you this morning, even if it's only virtually. But I want to give you all a big virtual hug. It's great to be with you. You know, we have never in our whole lives lived in a more difficult or challenging time than we're living now. The COVID crisis has produced such anxiety and fear and stress. Two old guys were talking together and one said to the other, you know, before COVID, I used to cough to cover up passing gas, but now during COVID, I'm passing gas to cover up coughing. And it's true, isn't it? We're all freaked out whenever anybody coughs. There's so much stress and anxiety around and so much hardship and division. The church is no longer fighting over the color of carpet, but over masks or no masks and conspiracy theories. The church has never had more issues to be divided over than we have today. And that's why the title of my message is Our Greatest Need in 2020. If you would turn with me, please, to 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your living, active, powerful word. And thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit that pulls back the curtain and lets us see and understand. And we welcome your Holy Spirit this morning to reveal Christ in your word, to reveal truth to us, to renew our thinking, to touch our hearts and to transform us, Lord, to be more like you. We ask this in your wonderful and powerful name. Amen. Verse 5b begins with this. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Our greatest need in 2020, I think, is humility. And no one's exempt. Verse 5 begins by saying all of you, old, young, elders, congregation, everybody needs humility. And then it goes on to say, clothe yourselves with humility. That means humility is our responsibility. It's something we do for ourselves. We clothe ourselves with it. And it's also a choice. This word clothe referred to a servant that was putting on an apron before serving, like Jesus did when he washed his disciples' feet in John 13. It says he girded himself with a towel, and then he began to wash their feet. Colossians 3 says, put on humility. It's our responsibility. And it says, humility towards one another. This word humility literally means lowliness of mind or thinking. It means to have a low view of one's own importance. It means to be have low self-preoccupation. Notice I didn't say low self-esteem. That, that can actually be a manifestation of pride. But low self-preoccupation, that's a manifestation of humility. C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And it says humility toward one another. Humility is a horizontal virtue. It's practiced towards others. It's one of 59 New Testament, one another's. Love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, be kind to one another, and be humble towards one another. Why is humility such a big deal? Well, verse 5 tells us because God actually opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humility is not only a horizontal virtue, it's also a vertical virtue. It affects our relationship with God. In fact, you can't have a relationship with God without humility because God himself is humble. In fact, Jesus only described himself with two qualities. In Matthew 11, verse 28 and 29, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle, or meek, and humble of heart. 
Jesus himself describes his, his, uh, one of his characteristics, one of two, as humility. And God, in, in uh, Philippians 2, verse 6 to 8, the scripture tells us how Jesus humbled himself. He humbled himself by not grasping equality with God. He humbled himself by laying aside his privileges to deity. He humbled himself by becoming human, by becoming a servant, by becoming obedient, and by dying on a cross. And God is not only humble, but he also hates pride. The Bible says here he opposes pride. He resists pride. It means he battles against pride. Many years ago, Mary and I were flying back from Vancouver to Winnipeg, and we were in the Vancouver airport in one of the waiting room lounges there. And it wasn't totally crowded, but it was fairly crowded. And we were sitting over in a corner, and I was, I was really happy. I was so happy. I was singing under my breath to myself. I was worshiping. I was having a nice time of worship. And Mary leans over to me, and she says, Ron, stop singing. You're annoying. I thought, what do you mean I'm annoying you? I'm worshiping. I thought, I'm just going to carry on worshiping. So I carried on singing under my breath. It was low. Within one minute, this absolute stranger who is sitting near us leans over and he says, excuse me, sir, could you stop singing? And I was so shocked. I stopped. I thought, what the heck? A total stranger telling me to stop singing. And of course, Mary's going, I told you so. Anyway, as I sat there stunned, the Holy Spirit reminded me of this verse. God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And I thought, oh, Lord, that was so arrogant of me. God opposes the proud and gives grace. He battles against the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Well, humility is a big deal, not only because it affects our relationship with God, but because humility releases grace. It releases God to act in our lives with his divine blessings and power. This is fantastic. Not only does God approve of humility, he empowers humility. Every time someone acknowledges their need of God, every time someone apologizes, every time we confess our sin, every time we prefer others over ourselves, every time we even say thank you, we open the door to God's power and blessing because he gives grace to the humble. And humility is a big deal because it affects our relationship with people. Humility builds trust with others because it's others seeking. Pride destroys trust with others because it's self-seeking. Pride manifests itself in self-reliance and anger and rebellion and self-pity and insecurity and offense and worry and stubbornness and fear, arrogance, superiority, defensiveness. Our daughter, Elise, is uh, married to a fellow who's plant. They're both planting a church in York, England right now. And Elise is a teacher. She's been a teacher for probably 10 years. And she got a job this year, full-time job, teaching in England. And she's teaching, I think it's 14 or 15-year-olds. Anyhow, one of her classes is the absolute worst behaved class she has ever had in 10 years. She said it's unbelievable. They are absolutely unruly. They will not listen. They will not talk. And she put up with this day after day. Finally, she lost it. She blew up at them. She raged against them. And when she was finished, she was in tears and she just thought, I have, I have ruined my teaching career. Anyway, she, she went home that night and she went to the Lord and confessed her sin in it and she felt like the Lord said to her humble yourself 
So the next day she went back to the same class. She went into the class. She said, you know, yesterday your behavior was abysmal. It was terrible. It was incredibly disrespectful. But my reaction to your behavior and my own response was worse. It was incredibly disrespectful to you. It was inappropriate. It was unprofessional. And you didn't deserve my disrespect. And I was wrong. And I'm very sorry for that. Well, the atmosphere in the class totally changed. She said they were like a different group of kids. And after the class was over, one of the students came up to her and she said, Never in all my years of, teach, of, of being a student has a teacher ever apologized. You are the first one to ever do that. It affects our relationship with other people and it builds trust with other people. Well, verse six goes on and says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Verse 6 tells us one more thing about humility. It says it's always towards God. Under the mighty hand of God. Whenever we humble ourselves, it's not just towards others. It's actually first towards God. And it's our job to humble ourselves. It's God's job to exalt us. It says at the proper time, he may exalt you. And if we do God's job, he'll do our job. Well, how do you humble yourself? Verses 7 to 10 give us a couple of ways that we can humble ourselves under God's mighty hand. Verse 7 begins by saying this, Casting all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. One of the first ways we can humble ourselves under God's mighty hand is stop worrying and start believing. Cast all your anxieties on him. You know, worry is a symptom of pride. It's not trusting God. And this word casting means not just laying our burdens down. It actually means flinging them down, throwing them down. It has intentionality and purpose and even kind of violence getting rid of them. And where are we casting our cares? Onto God himself. And one of the ways we do that is through confession. Just by going to God and confessing, throwing those anxieties down. The other day I was walking around the house and I, I, I was just, I was out of sorts. And I think it was the Lord. I think it was the Holy Spirit. Suddenly I just had this awareness. I am dealing with a low-grade anxiety. I'm just feeling anxious. I couldn't put my finger on what it was. It was just there. And so I confessed it. I said, Lord, I confess that anxiety. You said be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make my request. So Lord, I, I, I give myself to you. I confess that. I turn away from it. I want to live in peace and let your peace guard my heart and mind. Boom. The anxiety was gone, and, it, and, and the Lord filled me with peace because we can cast our cares on him. And, and why can we do that? Because he cares for us, verse 6 says. Start believing God cares for you. Not only is God good, and not only is God powerful, but God cares and he cares for you. He knows you. He takes an interest in you. He's concerned for you. When we say yes to Jesus, and he gives us his Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit comes to live in us, joins our spirit to the resurrected Christ, and a miracle happens. We're born again, and the Holy Spirit lives within us. The Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Father, lives within us as our helper every moment of every day. He's there to help us, to aid us. Pride says, I can handle this. 
I'll take care of it. Humility says, I can't handle this. God, you take care of it. And then verse 8 goes on, and verse 8 says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The second way that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God is by being vigilant and firm in our faith. Verse 8 says, be sober-minded. That means be clear-headed and be watchful, be awake, be alert, give strict attention to. And then it says kind of this weird thing in the midst of humility. Your adversary, the devil or the accuser, the diabolist, the slanderer, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, is Peter saying here that we always need to be looking out for and on the watch for the devil? Should we always be giving our attention to the devil? I, I don't think that's what Peter's saying. I, I think what he's saying is be watchful and vigilant about your own attitudes and your own responses and your own reactions so that you don't give pride a place because you have an adversary who's prowling around looking for someone to devour, literally to swallow. And pride is his native language. Pride is his native land. When we respond in pride, we give the devil an opportunity. So Peter says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, resist the devil. Stand against him. Withstand him. Be firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Peter's readers were suffering. And when we suffer, it's so easy to become self-pitying, negative, critical, grumbling, complaining, blaming, accusing. And when we cooperate... That way, with the accuser, he devours us. I think Peter is encouraging the saints, the followers of Jesus, to stand against the accuser, the slanderer, by not complaining or blaming or grumbling, but being firm in their faith, affirming who God is and what he's done. And we stand firm in our faith by thinking of ourselves less and thinking of God more. And we do that through worship and praise and thanksgiving and declaring God's word and memorizing it and meditating on it. And when we do that, we resist the devil. We withstand him. We, 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 we stand against him. We set ourselves against him and we cooperate with our advocate, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Peter goes on in verse 10 and he says, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace... That's so beautiful. Who has called you into his eternal glory will himself restore... That means to equip, to kit out, to heal, to mend. He'll confirm. He'll make us stable. He'll strengthen us. And he'll establish us. He'll give us a firm foundation. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, West Coast.